Anyone else want to add anything from uh, an encounter they had with Penina for her in her memory? Okay, I'm closing. I, I didn't know her, um, so I'm, uh, but I have, it's good that we have the opportunity to, to learn yeah, her more. Sure, sure. I thought well, really honored. Probably met her at Meyerland Minion years ago, maybe. And if I come across a picture, I'll share it with you to see if you recognize her. She came from New Orleans a number of years ago after the big hurricane there. Um, that's when she and her husband moved here, was from New Orleans. Thank um, you. Thank you. They to Chabad and they went to Beit Rambam and they went to Meyerland Minion. They kind of made the round. Yeah. Now, now, as, yeah, in the end, she was at Torah B'Chesed. Um, I enjoy speaking to every time I saw a tour of a chesed and a torch, uh, telling me that she, in, like she went back to school to study and wow. uh, wasn't, yeah, she went back to school to study. It wasn't easy, but she went back. Yes. Yeah, so, um, she was a music yeah. teacher. So music like was very much ingrained in her. Uh, I worked with her at Beit Yashurin. She was a music teacher there. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, so her her job prior, like which her career prior to, to do, going into teaching or what have you, well, I mean, she was still involved in teaching was um, like theater lighting, theater production stuff. The, the tech. So the, 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 the tech Welcome. Yeah. So good to see you, Bobby. Hi. Okay. Laura, so did to see you? When yeah. he was a did you guys see Dan when he was in Israel? So he was in Israel, Pesach. Uh, my son stayed with him. He was renting an apartment in the center of town. And uh, my son met up with him. And it was very nice. He hosted my son because my son had a, a job in, in, during Pesach. He's a waiter for this caterer. And he works together with Josh, his son. So it was nice. They hung out and had the meals with Dan. Uh, was very honored that he reached out to me down and he's like, please learn, you know, in her honor. So, okay, we're going to dedicate the learning for her. We are in Israel, in Pashat Bamidbar. We started the new book. And in America, you're still in Vayikra, in Parshat Bechukotai. So now when we're looking at, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bechukotai and also Bamidbar, okay? So, Bechukotai, we were talking about it last week, is a kind of like, some people call it the rebuke Parsha. It's like a scary Parsha because it has 13 verses, which are beautiful. It's all about the blessings. If you walk in God's paths, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get a Ferrari. You'll have a Cadillac. You'll have rain in its time. You'll have Parnassah. You'll have all these amazing things. Oh, but if you don't walk in God's paths, if you don't walk in the ways of Hashem, this is what's going to happen to you. There's 30 verses of what seems to look like curses, you know? And there's a famous story about um, one of the Rebbe's, um, I, maybe Bill, you could tell me who, uh, Chabad, that once the, the Rebbe couldn't read the Torah reading of that week and someone else read it and the son was trembling and he was crying and they said to him, why you don't cry? Why are you not anxious every year when we read, read this portion of the week? And he says, because when my father reads it, the curses sound like blessings, right? Because the interpretation, the sweetness that he would put into it, it would show that that the, these these curses are really not curses. And what what do I mean by that? Do, Bailey, do you know what was said about the story? I'm not sure. I remember which ever. Yeah. So, but the concept of it is is very amazing. Really, when a parent punishes a child. We have to be careful. I mean, and some of us don't have little ones anymore, but a real punishment that comes from a parent to a child comes, if it's done correctly, is from a loving place, that the child knows that the father didn't just lose it, had a bad temper, had a bad day, and took it out on the child. If it's truly coming from the right place to help your child be a mensch, to educate them, so the child will know, inner, inner, inside, they might cry and stuff, but on the inside, they know my parents love me and they're whatever, they won't let me go out to the game with my friends because something I did. 
And it's because they care about me and they want me to be successful in life and a member in society and a mensch, you know? And when it's done with love like that, so it's not a curse. When we're looking at those 30 verses of curses, that if you don't walk in my path, this will happen. We really have to understand the premises of it. The basis of it is that Hashem loves us. Hashem loves us so much that he wants to ensure that we walk on the right path. Now, let's go back to the blessings. The chukotai, it's interesting, starts with the letter uh, Aleph, the verse, im chukotai, if in my laws you will walk. And it ends, the blessings end with the letter Taf. It says, I will walk you upright. You will be, so it shows something very interesting. The blessings start with Aleph and end with a Taf. What did the alphabet, right? Aleph, all the way to the last letter. God is saying, if you walk in the path of God, you walk in my ways, it's going to be abundance for you, like endless, like Aleph Ataf, an expression. I bless you from A to Z, right? There's no words. There's no words for it. This is like, it's just, it's, it's, it's without any limitation, okay? It's from A to Z. Now, interesting that the verses go very, very smoothly. They go straight. They're going from Aleph to Taf. The blessings are, there's no interruptions in the verses. When it comes, which is interesting, because when it comes, when it comes to the curses, the next 30 verses after the 13 verses of blessings, it actually, there's a lot of hiccuping, a lot of interruption. Every verse starts with, if you don't walk in my way, then this will happen. And I will add this on. And then again, it says, and if you don't walk in my way, I will add this. And if you don't walk in my way, I will add this. And if you don't walk in my way, I will add this. Why? God is like ways. You can ways that you want to get to bait Rambam. Yeah? And you have taken the wrong path. You made a right instead of a left. So ways will say reroute, reroute. It reroutes you, right? Like a GPS and says, here's what we're going to do. And the next intersection you're going to turn and reroute yourself and go back to your destination god is always allowing us the exit way when we don't take his path he doesn't start with like smack i'm gonna punish you there's a reminder you're not on the path there's exit signs constant exit signs that god allows us to exit like we oh we're on the wrong path okay you're you can exit this wrong path and reroute yourself to get back on the right path. Interesting also when you read the curses, the 30 verses of the curses, it actually, it starts with remote, like farthest, like you will be punished by um, your things. You won't have things like parnasa, livelihood. And then the if you continue to not listen to God, it gets closer and closer. And then there's the affliction on the body. Why? Because God's always trying to give us the hint, give us the reminder. Hey, you're not, it's like a person who has high cholesterol, right? The body's talking to them, right? Hey, you're not eating right. You're not balanced, right? So you got to reroute yourself. You got to eat better. You got to start walking. You got to start listening to your body. Oh, you don't listen to your body. Then what happens? And there might be plaque in the arteries, then there might be a stroke. It doesn't start right away. Our body gives us subtle messages, but then if we don't listen to subtle messages, they become unsubtle, right? They're like, it becomes louder and louder and louder. But what's nice really about our body is that it will usually give us a warning. Like if someone does blood work, they could see they're pre-diabetic. They don't just become diabetic in a day. That can happen, but usually... There is some kind of warning. <clears throat> Hashem gives us the warnings. He wants us to walk in the right path. Now, interesting, and we spoke about this last week a little bit. Why, and this is very puzzling to everybody, all the commentators ask this, when we're talking about when you walk in God's path, that God says, if you walk in my ways, you will be blessed with all this materialistic stuff. There's no mention of Olam Haba, of the world, Tom. There's no mention of the Garden of Eden. 
It's all materialistic stuff. Like I will give you the Cadillac. You'll have a really good job. I mean, it's not like that, but it's, it talks about material stuff. It talks about your peace with your enemies. You're going to have rain in a time. You will have abundance in your fields if you walk in my path. Well, so what's going on here? What is going on here? Why there's no, why is the five books of Moses, there's no mention of the world to come. We believe in the world to come. We know that there is a soul and we know that this is not the end, right? And that there's life after life, real life, eternity. So why there's no mention of it? Why only, so to say, the bribery is materialistic stuff? God is saying, if you do this, live this very spiritual life, you will be blessed with all this physicality. So we have to understand something. We are, and the last Rabbi actually said this, we are people. We are, Judaism is, we are, we are the people of this world. Olam hazeh, olam hazeh versus olam hazeh, where does the world come? It's very easy to die on Kiddush Hashem, to die for the sake of God, uh, sacrifice your soul because someone was going to make you um, worship an idol. That's easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier than living a sanctified life that sanctifies God daily, right? To walk in God's path in this very materialistic world, that is much harder than dying for the sake of heaven. Like Rabbi Akiva died because teaching Torah, the Romans tortured him and they killed him. He died. It's much harder to live a life, which he did also, which to sacrifice your daily life every day to live and to stick to your values and your rules and your principles versus to just die, right? So we we don't value, meaning we value, this is how my the rabbis say it is. Olam Abba is like the pension. It's like, it's your retirement money, okay? Because God, whatever good we do, there's definitely an account for it. And God rewards us for the smallest things, you know, for the mamish, the smallest things. There's accounting and stories of people who died and said, we can't get over how, how much reward we got in the world to come just for having a good thought, just for smiling to someone, just for doing chesed, just for doing things that seemed so mundane. God rewarded them. And like they say, if we knew how much reward God would have given us, maybe we would have been inspired and motivated to do more of it, okay? So it's definitely there, Hashem rewards us for everything we do. But what God is saying in this parsha, Bechukotai, he's saying, it's like he's interviewing us for a job, okay? When you're 20 years old, what's, you're going to get interviewed for a job. It's not going to motivate you, so to say, uh, oh, come to our company. You will get a very good retirement plan and a pension plan. You're 20. You're not thinking of your pension, right, when you're 20. That's more closer to 50, 60. You're starting to think, okay, what is going to be my retirement plan, right? When I retire, I get older. When I lo- no longer work, what's going to happen? What what's, what God is saying, it's like if someone is interviewing someone and they get they tell them, listen, we pay a really good salary. That's Olam Abba. God gives us a very good salary for any good deeds we do in this world. It's a karmic energy that we put out there. When we do good deeds, it's going to meet us back in Olam Haba. But God says further than that, forget Olam Haba. We are people of this world. I put you in this world to sanctify my name in this world. And the reward is that you're going to get amazing working conditions. Work environments, amazing. So you go to an interview and they tell you, not only you're going to get a very good salary with us, but our work environment's amazing. Like you're going to get vacation days. You're going to get uh, professional development. You have a spa. We have massages every day to our workers. We have coffee. We have free lunches. We have free breakfast. Okay, now you're talking. That is very like, wow. That's something to think about, right? If you will walk, this is the name of this parsha in the first verse of this parsha. If you walk in my paths, I'm promising you a very good life in this world, not in the next world. That's a given. 
You will get a reward, reward in the next world, but you will also get a very good life in this life. It's a karmic energy. You will attract goodness into your life. <clears throat> you walk in my path, God promises us, you will have rain, you will have peace, you will have a good life, much a good life. You will have serenity, you know, you have clarity. You will have what you need, material -wise. So what is this? It's talking about the working conditions. That's why you won't hear them mention in the five books of Moses of Olam Haba, because we are people of this world. God says, I don't want you thinking about the next world. Of course, we're motivated by it, by reward and punishment. Of course, we worry about that. It's something in the back of our mind. But what really entices us, what really inspires us is that we see that when we walk in God's ways, we live an ethical life. We have a good life. You know, like, thank God. Like, I think, like, to be Jewish is so amazing just for the fact that we are part of a community, you know, right? The benefit of being part of a klal. Like, when my son was sick in the hospital, we were in, when we were in a... When we were in Houston, Aishel House was giving us meals every day, you know? And when we were in New York with them, we were getting meals from three different organizations. And I actually told them, we don't need so much food. But they were so wanting to give us, you know, there was, and, and I remember the nurse said to me, you really have an amazing family. She saw every day I was getting so much food. As a food, I used to give it out to the nurses. The nurses would come to my room and doctors and do you have some more of your kugel, some more of that schnitzel? I was feeding everybody, which gave me a really good point because I was feeding everybody. I made a seder. I had doctors that were shift. They were so happy. I invited them to our seder. And what they were like, just, you have such an amazing family. And I was like, this is not my immediate family. It's the Jewish community, you know? And it's like the benefit of being part of the Jewish community is something incredible. You know what I'm saying? Like, I really did feel it, that my son, Elisha, wasn't just my son. He became the son of the Jewish people, like all the communities. He touched so many people in Israel and the community in New York that we lived in and um, my community in San Antonio that I came from, my community in Houston, right? The large community in Houston. It wasn't just the Orthodox, the Reformed, the Conservatives. I mean, unbelievable, you know, how much support that we got. And that's just being part of this life of being a Jew. Hashem says, wow, you're going to have a very good materialistic life. I'm going to, you're going to be padded. You're going to be supported, right? That's really what it's about. And I think this message for this generation is so important because when we're talking to youth, right? When, and I work with youth. It's not appealing to them say, oh, if you learn Torah and you walk the path, if you're going to be a mensch, and you be kind, and you do mitzvah, they're going to have a shit world to come. They're like, what? Like, what does that mean for a 15-year-old? It's not their language. Psychologically, you got to talk to kids in their language. That's not appealing to them. But if you tell a 15-year-old, wow, you walk in the paths of God, you're, you're going to have so much support and fun. You're going to feel such serenity. You're going to have such opportunities. You know, you're going to have a salary of a high tech, uh, like someone working in a really good position, like it, that is talking their language, right? So this Parsha is really talking our language, this world's language. And we're not the people of the next world. Shem put us in this world to sanctify this world, to bring heaven down to earth, to constantly do this bridging. That's what we're here for. So now this is Bechukotai. And we spoke about the blessings and the curses. We spoke about the curses coming from the perspective as a loving parent that is putting us back and rerouting us, allowing us to constantly do restarts, right? Not as punishments where I hate you, I'm going to afflict you and take away things from you. It's more, I'm reminding you, you're not doing well. Cholesterol is going high. It's time to exercise and eat better. That's really what it's about, you know? Go back, go back, go back and reroute. Now this ends the this parsha ends the book of Leviticus, Vayikra. 
which the laws of the Kohanim and um, the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the, the jobs of the, of the Kohens, the Korbanot, right? It's very much like a book of teaching the nation, talking to them as a group. You came out of Mitzrayim, you were half-baked, you were not really ready. I pulled you out. You're psychologically definitely not there. You're emotionally not there. But Hashem said, well, we better get them out and rescue them. Because if not, they're going to go down 40. They were already down 49 degrees of, of defilement. And now, during Sefirah Omer, we are making our way back 49 levels of Kedusha. Every day we add and we work on another character trait, as we explained in, in other weeks that we were talking about this. So we're making our way a week and a half to our wedding. Interesting that this week's Parsha of Midbar is always read before Shavuot. Always. Why? Because a Midbar has a nickname. It's the book of, um, it's the Ramban, calls it Pekudim, the accounted ones. It starts with the verse, it starts with the commandment that God is going to do a census, a demographic, so to say, study. And he's counting them. Each and every one, he says, B'nai Israel will be counted. But not as families, not as tribes. It says, Ish, Ish, Legulgolotam. Mamash, an individual head count. Moishi, Zalman, Chaya, Devorah, Yocheved. You understand? It's each person is getting counted individually. There's a shift between this book of Leviticus and Bamidbar. What is Bamidbar called in, in English? I forgot. I can't hear you. You're mute. Numbers. numbers. It's called numbers. numbers. Exactly. It's about numbers, okay? It's accounting, numbers. It's individual. We're going from the cloud, from the general, from community. Now we're going to individual. Why? Because we cannot receive the Torah without each and every one of us realizing how important we are, how we matter, okay? The language that the verses use, it says, Sa rosh kol b'nei Israel. Lift the head of b'nei Israel. What does that mean, literally lift? It's not a chiropractic adjustment. It's lift the head. What God is, is empowering us. God says, it's like someone who has diamonds. Here, I want to show you something. This used to be my husband's um, box, a wooden box that his father gave him when he was five years old. And he used to collect rocks. And my husband gave it now. To, we found it in my father-in-law's house. He gave it to us. And now my son is collecting different rocks, different colors, right? And he will count these rocks literally every day. He comes back from school as if some monster came and took them, and he goes through it. One, two, three, the white one, the green one, the black one, the blue one. This is what God is. When something is precious to us, count it. It's like you have diamonds. God is saying, you're precious. You're precious. Bobby, you're precious. Bela, you're precious. Literally talking to us, Devorah, you're precious. And he's, he's lifting us up. What he's doing is he's shining the light and highlighting the godliness that's within us, the spark of godliness that each and every one of us has. And it's really all about our personal, unique mission that each and every one of us has. And it's unique no. to us. No one. So sorry, is some, no. everybody can. Can it also be accountability that each one as an individual is accountable for the yeah. mitzvahs and doing what they need to do. Yeah. So it goes both ways. It's responsibility, but it also the idea that you matter. That, and, and here's what we're going to talk about. We all have a personal, unique mission. I'm going to give you an example. Like you're, there's a mosaic, a beautiful picture, and there's a space. And it needs a very specific rock, a rock that's going to fit this exact space. Each and every one of us is that specific gem and rock that is very specific to that specific space. And it's, what does it mean? It means that each and every one of us was given tools and a mission. And you're like a spy who is given a mission and 
is in everything they need, the instructions, the tools, and go and do your mission, you know? And can you imagine that you are sent out on a mission and you're not given the destination or where you need to go or what you need to do. And they're like, look, you're a spy, go to Iran, this, do your thing. Whoa, wait a minute, don't leave me here, Iran. Like, just, no, like, tell me what I need to do. You know, I was always very inspired by the story of Ellie Cohen, our man in Damascus, in Damascus, right? We're still fighting to get his bones back, right? His wife is still alive, by the way, and his kids are around and they're constantly pleading and, and hoping and yearning to get their father's remains back here in Israel. So Eli Cohen was very clear on what he needed to do. And he sacrificed his life. He knew it was dangerous. Never even shared what he was doing, you know? And he sacrificed his life for the Jewish people, you know? Our, we have a job and we have a unique mission that's very specific to us. And I'm gonna give you hints that our Hasidic masters give us to how to recognize our unique mission. And I'm going to say this, and I've said this a few times. The Slonim Rebbe says this, you could be a very righteous person, and you have kept 613. You go up to heaven, and God said, have you fulfilled your mission, your unique destiny, your uniqueness, your gift that you had to give to the world? And you're like, no. And God says, sorry, you got to go back. It's not a punishment, but you get the opportunity you get recycled, you get back, and most of us are recycled souls, so don't feel bad about it, but hopefully we don't have to keep recycling. Each and every one of us in our core knows what our mission is, and I'm going to give you three hints but at the end of the class of how to find your mission in life, okay? So it's interesting that like, you could do all the mitzvot, but there's like this unique mission, your unique gift, your unique light that you need to give to the world. So why is God counting them before Kabbalah to Torah, before they're going to receive the Torah? He's highlighting to each and every individual, this is your godly spark, your unique gift, your unique mission that you're going to bring, your contribution, contribution to the world. And he's highlighting it for us, and he's empowering us, right? And he's allowing us to realize that we matter. And there'll never be in history another Devorah Cohen, and if you look around right now on Zoom, none of us look alike. Identical twins don't even look alike. It's interesting. I don't know if you remember those Siamic, do you say Siamic? Siami twins? How do you say that? Siamese. Okay, on Hebrew you say Siami. Siamese. Okay, there were these Persian Siamese twins. Lala, I forgot the name of the other one. They were two separate bodies connected in the head. And they were so different. Each one of them was very introverted and one was very outgoing. They had very different like um, uh, desires and yearnings and talents. Like one was an artist, one, one was not interested in art at all, was more of a mathematician. They were so different that they were so tired of being tied with each other. And for many years, they were procrastinating doing this surgery. That was going to be very risky. And at 27 years old, they finally did the surgery, but they didn't make it. They died. But it's because they had this unique individual life, but they were connected, you know, physically. And yet they were so different. There's no one in the world, right? Our fingerprints are so different, right? Like if I get fingerprinted for whatever reason, background check for a teaching job, I'm not afraid for a bit that Osama bin Laden's profile is going to show up, because, right? Because no one, I have my fingerprints, yes, is, right? There's no mistakes because there's very, there's never been such a thing that there's double fingerprints in the world, right? You have people that might look very similar, you know, but there's no such thing even identical twins have something that separates them, right? I, in a spiritual level, we are different. We have a unique gift, a unique gift that we have to give to the world. And it's important to identify it, okay? And this, you, <coughs> we get reminded of this now 
Why? Because we're about to receive the Torah. It's called Chag Kabbalat Torah. The receiving, the holiday of receiving the Torah. Why? It's an individual thing. It's not something that is given. It's given to the nation, but it's each and every one of us has to go through the process of accepting the Torah, receiving the Torah. Hashem is giving the gift, but individually we receive it. The same thing with Sfirat Omer. It says, Usfartem Lachem. Lachem means in Hebrew, to you individually. Grammatically, that's what it means. No one, by the way, it's interesting. I can make Kiddush for Yocheved, like Yocheved, you could come to me for Shabbat, and I make Kiddush, and I have your mind, it's as if you did Kiddush, right? You go to shul, your rabbi does Havdalah, he does the Havdalah, you don't have to come home and do the Havdalah, right? He had your mind, and he was Yotzi us. When it comes to Firat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer, you, no one could do it for you, okay? You have to do your own counting of the Omer. <coughs> the same goes for receiving of the Torah. No one can receive the Torah for you but you. It's a contract, an individual contract between you and God. God says here is a blueprint for a very good life. Like what we were talking about, your week's Parsha, which is last week's Parsha in Israel. We're going to meet up. Israel and the diaspora meets up right before Simchas Torah. This doesn't happen every year, but because this year was a leap year, we are ahead of you in one Parsha, which makes my life a little bit difficult because <laughs> I teach in Israel an in-person class Monday morning. I was teaching this morning. By us, it's 8 p.m. now. And I'm already one week ahead. So you guys get last week's Parsha and this week's Parsha. And then next week you'll get also, again, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So um, this it's it's a contract that is a contract, it's an individual contract. And therefore, Hashem counts us now, that this is the whole book of numbers. We came out as a whole, okay? And that is, okay. We came out as a whole, Am Israel, we were we were birthed at. We always say that coming out of out of Egypt, we went through the Red Sea. That was the birth canal, and it split. That was the birth, the birth of a nation. That's when we become Am Israel. But now, in order to create a strong nation, we need strong individuals. Judaism always puts an emphasis on the individual, like we put a very big emphasis on the family, family purity, the uh, the father, the mother the children, kibbut aim, the mutual contract of a, what a parent gives a child and what a child does for his parents and owes his parents, right? Kibbut aim. Because without strong individuals that make strong families, that make strong nations, we will not have Am Yisrael and we are not merited to receive the Torah. You know, and it's interesting that our enemies always knew that. They've always tried to destroy the family. They knew that that would oppress us. Like Antiochus, right? Like there were all these kind of rules when Israel, when the Jewish people went through persecutions, like the Greeks had this terrible rule that a bride, would, that's why they would get married in hiding. But if they find out about it, the bride would have to live with the emperor. Why? Because it would defile her she would be like traumatized from that. Then she wouldn't have a good marriage with her husband. The foundation would be shaky. So always that's where they go for, attack the enemy, attack the family, attack the family cell, family values, you know? What's happening now, it's a little bit scary. It's like, yeah, you know, family, you know? The family values are so important for us, you know? And that's what creates the strong nation. So it's all about the individual elevating himself, God elevating the individual, and us realizing that the whole world rests on our shoulders. So I was hearing a story about this rabbi. He was giving a class, and there's a doctor sitting in his shiur, and he was talking about our mission in life and we all have a unique mission. And 
the doctor said a light bulb went on and he said, you know, he's the head of a maternity department in Tel Aviv and he was about to leave work. And there's a woman, he, he was not even his job. He's not one of the doctor's doctors. He's the head of the department. And he, they, he heard that there was a woman that, um, I don't know what it's called in English, but it's um, something to do with the amniotic fluid leaking in to the woman that dangers the woman. It goes into her body and the woman, 97% of women die when this happens at birth, God forbid, and the babies don't make it. So it's like this poisoning that happens in the body. I forgot what it's called. Um, so he ran in there and like literally saved the day, saved the woman and the baby, you know? And as he's sitting in the shiur and saying, you have a unique mission, you were brought down here to the world, a specific place that no one else could do. He says to the rabbi, who knows, maybe I was brought down here to the world, I became a doctor just for this one instant that I saved this woman's life and this baby's life. And I'm sure he has done many more savings, but for some reason, he had this very strong sense that he was in the right place in the right time with the right knowledge to help the situation. A few months later, he retired early and he was a little bit kind of like depressed and speaking to the rabbi and the rabbi said to him, do you remember that you actually felt that you have reached your mission, right? So if you fulfilled your mission, you know, we will have many missions, like they change. Like when your children are young, your mission could be just to be a mother, right? And sometimes when you're, children are young, you're also in some kind of other position where you're a rabbit's in, and that could be your mission too. And sometimes you take a break from it and you say, my mission is to go back home. It shifts, your mission shifts, it fluctuates with where you are in life, okay? It's not necessarily the same thing. There is a core mission that we all have, okay? And like for me, it's very clear to me, it's always been, for me, it's teaching women and inspiring women and it's something that has always like been in the back of my mind. I might take breaks from it. I might do more of it. I might do less of it. It depends on what's going on in my life. You know what I'm saying? But that's kind of like, I would say my yaud, my destiny, my mission, okay? And when I mean destiny, I once gave this parable, is if you come in Israel, you could go to the central bus station and there's the, the information desk. And you go and say, they ask you, what's your yad? What's your destiny? Destination, where do you want to go to? And what, what if you tell the guy, I don't know. I don't know where I want to go to. So what does he say back to you? I'm sorry, can't tell you what bus it takes because you don't really know where you want to go to. If you say, I need to go to Tel Aviv, he could tell you, okay, take this bus. And it's in five minutes, it's going to be there. And it's, uh, it's on the second floor, this bus. <coughs> So it helps us to know our mission because then we have a goal and then we make our way towards that destination, okay? That's why it's important. It's important to find your purpose, right? Because you will fulfill your fullest potential and your gift and contribution to the world. And that's really what it's about. It's about us being the full potential individual that God brought here to the world, your unique you. Be you, right? I think Nike, Nike has this uh, kind of like slogan, be you, right? So be you because no one else could be you, right? It's like so sad that so many of us like sometimes get caught up is I want to be Chaya and Chaya wants to be Devorah. So no one getting anything done, okay? There's this cute Hasidic story about a wagon driver and this very like the nobleman who used to invite all the poor people to his house on Shabbat for a big Shabbat meal. So one Arab Shabbat, the noble, the wagon carrier, they're both on the road and the wagon carrier runs home, takes a shower and the nobleman, he takes one of these luxurious showers, you know, he has shampoo for his nostrils, shampoo for his hair. It's not like the wagon driver going to the shower one kind of soap out. So he's done with his shower and his slate already. And he's on the way to synagogue. It's a Friday night. And he sees a wagon stuck in the mud with a wagon driver, another wagon driver, 
and he's like, how could I ignore this? And he helps him, pulls him out of the mud. Now he's full of mud, so he goes back home and he doesn't go to shul that night. And now the wagon driver is sitting in the synagogue, the other wagon driver, and there are all these poor people. And after synagogue, they're used to, after the prayer, after the services, that no man is there says, okay, having a big meal and kiddush and Shabbat meal at my house. But he's not there because he was full of mud. So what happens? Noble man can't invite the, he's not where he should be because he didn't do his job. He was doing wagon driver's job. Wagon driver can't invite the poor people because he doesn't have the money, right? So what happened is if we're not in our element and I'm doing someone else's job, so things are not getting done. If I will try to be Bobby and Bobby be me, so what's going to happen? Things are going to fall to the wayside, right? Like, who's going to take care of my little one? I'm not going to know who to take care of in Bobby's life, right? Hear what I'm saying? We have our circles that we impact. And if I try to, like, say, oh, I just don't feel like being who I am. I want to just be some princess right now, you know? So it's important to know our place and our mission. And by the way, don't take yourself for granted. The fact that you're doing things that you don't necessarily want to do, but it's there and you got to do it. You know, in Hebrew, they say, tap on the shoulder, like all to you, all the merit to you, you know? Sometimes if I don't feel like being a mom every day, but my kids remind me I ain't going anywhere. You know what I'm saying? I have a sister who's a social worker. I offered her, hey, you want to come take my kids for a week? She didn't take my offer. But um, you know what I'm saying? Like we all have things in life we don't want to do, but we do that, right? That's our tafki. That's our mission. That's our job. That's our position. That's our role. That's where we're supposed to be, right? So <laughs> we have to understand something about our mission. And I'm going to go back to King David and to King Shaul, Saul, okay? What is, there's, the Tom brings and says like this, King Shaul sinned and got punished severely and lost kingship because of it. He ceased to be the king of Israel and he lost the kingdom. David Amelech, King David sinned and he doesn't lose the kingdom. King David's machut, his kingship is still, is still here. Meaning Mashiach ben David is the one who is going to be ruling and that the Davidic dynasty is the one that's going to rule forever and still rules, okay? So what happens here? Is there some kind of like um, discrimination against King Shaul? So let's like go back for a minute into the prophets, into the story. What was King Shaul's sin? He was told to kill all the Malachites. Don't leave an animal. Don't leave a child. You got to annihilate all of them because they're merciless. They're, they have no mercy towards the Jewish people. They have sinned against the Jewish people, and they're only going to cause trouble for us forever. What happened? King Shaul goes out to war, kills all the Malachites, but does not exercise Gavur. He suddenly has Rachmanus, and he keeps the king of Amalek. Melech Agag, he keeps him alive. And that night, and he puts him in jail. And that night, Melech Amalek Agag, he impregnates a slave that's in jail. And out of him comes Haman Amalek. This dynasty of Amalek continues because King Saul didn't do a job. Because he had mercy in a place that, and Talmud says, sometimes mercy is, is going to lead you to be cruel to those who are kind being having mercy on those who are cruel will cause you in the long run to be uh cruel to those who are kind so it was wrong of shaul to keep the king alive and 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 the, the shmuel and the prophet comes to keep to shaul and says you will lose kingship because of this which he did he lost the kingdom, and King David became the, the king. What, did, what was the sin of King David? King David, David Amelech, he 
desired Batsheva. And by the way, I have to go back from it and do an intro. It's really important to understand that when we're talking about the giants of King Shaul and David HaMelech, people that God chose them to be the king of Israel, David HaMelech who wrote the Psalms, okay, who knew the whole Torah and King Shaul that was very, very righteous. We come and talk about it from a place of, of humility, you know, of, of we don't really understand what we're saying, okay? That Talmud says, Kol haomer, Shaul David chata eno el meaning that we, when we say they sinned on their level, it was a sin, okay? When we're looking at King David, what was the sin? King David saw in prophecy that Bathsheba was going to be his wife, that Shlomo HaMelech was going to be born from them, that the base of Migdash will be built from that son. So what happened is he sends Bathsheba's husband to war and Uriah and he gets killed, and then he takes Bathsheba. And Nathan and Abi comes to him and he says, in a parable, he says to him, I want to give a parable to a man who was very, very poor and he only had one lamb. Came this man and took his one lamb. What do you think we should do with this? And, and slaughtered it. King David, what do you think we should do with this man? King David said, that is a terrible sin. The one thing this guy had, he took from him. So, so Nathan and Abi, Nathan the prophet says to him, you're right. That was the wrong thing to do. You had no permission to activate destiny. You should have waited for Bacheva naturally to become your wife. The fact that you sent her husband to war to be killed so you could have Bacheva prematurely, that was sin. Okay? Now, for some reason, King David doesn't loom, does not lose the kingship to it. Why? So the Hasidic masters tell us something very, very powerful. I feel so bad. I have to run and get water. I'm really thirsty. I, I usually have a water bottle next to me. Okay. <clears throat> I'm back. Sorry. Um, so what is the difference between King David and Shaul? Shaul sinned in his mission. He was a king. God said, you're the king. And so to say, like, he destroyed his working tools. He's like, I don't feel like exercising being a king right now. I want, I'm soft-hearted. Like a king has a leadership and do things that are not comfortable for them. King David sinned in his personal life. It was not moral. It was not the right thing to do. But it wasn't in his mission. He didn't mess up his mission. His mission was to be the king of Israel. He needed to do teshuva. He was punished at his son from the union with Bathsheba. The first son was died, right? But he didn't lose the kingdom to it, okay? There's a difference here. Because when we, God forbid, take our mission and we push it away and we say, no, I'm sorry, I don't feel like dealing with my mission. Uh, no, no, no. I don't want to be Devorah Cohen. I want to be Kate Middleton. I would like to have her close. Yes, that's true. Um, but like, you understand? When you fight your destiny, your mission, that is fighting the highest order. That we cannot do. And I'll take another example from the, from, from the stories of the Bible. From Megillat Estel. There's a dialogue that is very dramatic and very astounding between Mordechai and Esther. And he comes to her and tells her, listen, there's going to be a Holocaust. The Jewish people are going to get annihilated. And you got to go in there. And you got to be proactive about this, which means that he was letting over her as his wife, because there's an opinion that she was his wife. All those years that she's in the palace, she was still allowed to go to the mikvah and be with her husband. You know this? The Talmud tells us. So, but the minute she initiated to be with with Akashvera, she could no longer go back to be with uh, her husband. So he knew he's losing her as a wife. But he said, she says to him, Mordechai, I can't do this. It's a one-way lock. He, I can't just walk into my husband, uh, the Akashvera's room. He doesn't, he didn't call me. He didn't call me for months. And he says to her something very harsh. He said, Esther, I'll tell you, 
להימלט, don't think you can escape, you know, the destiny, and who knows, if not for this, you came to Malchus, you came into kingship because of this. He said, what do you think? Four years, he's looking for a wife. He had Vogue magazines. He could have chosen every wife, any wife, girl he wants. And he chose the wife of the rabbi, the firmest girl in town. He chose Esther. Yeah? What do you think? It's a coincidence? This was your mission. This is your purpose in life. Don't cut the branch to the tree that you're sitting on. God brought you to the world for this moment. The fate of Jewish people rest on your shoulders. And he says to her, who knows? And, and it's frustrating to read that and say, what do you mean? If I'm a leader, I inspire someone to do something. I would not be inspired if my rabbi tells me, who knows it for this? You came to kingship. Who knows? That's not what Mordechai is saying. Uh, Mordechai has come from a place of being humble and says, who knows? But he says, one thing I do know, Be'et hazo he got the malchut. You have this moment reached kingship for this reason, right? For this reason, for the reason to save the Jewish people. That is your mission. That is your purpose. And he says to her, if you don't do this purpose, at uveit avichto bedu. What does that mean? You and your father's house will be annihilated. What does that mean? Your life will be purposeless. Like you're not going to fulfill your mission. You don't really have a reason to go on living, so to say, because you brought to the world for that one moment to save the Jewish people. We're not talking about saving one person. We're talking about saving millions of Jews. Millions, because the Jews were all over these provinces. You know, I don't know how many Jews were at the time, but I'm talking about the entirety of the Jewish people did rest on her shoulders, right? So we're seeing that there's this concept of mission, of purpose, that is very unique. Only Esther could have done it. No one else could have done it. Mordechai could have done it. Only she could have done it. Now, and we're going to continue this next week. We're going to elaborate about this next week, Bezrat Hashem. How do we find our mission? And I will give you two things. It will seem contradictory, but they actually sit under the same umbrella. One, your mission is something that is easy for you, something that you love to do, something that you're good at, that you get a lot of enjoyment doing, that when you're doing it, you're like, ah, oh, this is what I was brought down here to the world, okay? And I'll give you some examples, okay? Like, I love teaching women. It's not like a burden for me. I love it. This is my mission. I love it. It's not stressful for me. Okay. The, um, the other thing, which will seem contradictory, but it's really the other side of it. There's, there's our destiny, our yehud of what we have to give here to the world. There's that part of contribution and our gift to the world. And there's that tikkun, the, the one thing unique to us that we need to fix that no one else can fix. And it's something that is hard for us. It could be your mission in life is to is to help others in some kind of form. And then your tikkun could be to not be judgmental. Like you find yourself being judgmental and it's something for years you're aware it's a pattern of yours and that's your tikkun because it's every Yom Kippur, your New Year resolution, God help me not to be judgmental, okay? I'm just giving you an example, okay? Now your yehud can be to just be a mom, not to just. That could be your yehud. I'm a mom. No one else could do that. No one else could be my child mom. Now you could have a global yehud, a global mission, which is to help others, to elevate others, to inspire others. Your yehud, your mission could be to find a cure for cancer. If you're a researcher, your yehud could be to learn Kabbalah. Some people get unbelievable enjoyment and inspiration from learning. Torah, and maybe their Yehud is to teach Torah, but it's not everybody's mission to teach Torah. It's not fitting for everybody. For some people, they're, they're, they get juiced, they get inspired, they get excited about learning Chassidut. That's what inspires them. Some people, what inspires them is to teach it, to learn it and to teach it. Your Yehud could be inspiring 
uh, battered women. Your youth could be being a community leader. Your youth could be, you name it. You know, you, each and every one of you knows what you're good at, you know, and it could be your inner circles or, or it could be a global thing, you know. None of them are less or more. It's unique to you, okay? So this week you have homework to think, don't even go into tune right now of what you need to fix, but think about it. What excites you? What brings you great joy? And I'm not talking about universal pleasures like, oh, I love listening to Beethoven and uh, sleeping till 11 o'clock every day. Now I'm not talking about like things like that. I'm talking about like unique things, you know, not necessarily just to you. It could be that me and have have like, we want to teach women. Like I'm saying, but I'm talking about something that is, everybody loves to listen to good music, right? I'm not necessarily women, right? My kids think it's boring, right? Classical music. I think it's awesome. But I'm saying like, what is your unique mission? Something that juices you, that inspires you, that lifts you up, that you love doing and think about it and do more of it. That is your mission. That is your tough key. I'm actually like in a um, in the summer. I'm learning life coaching, and I'm gonna help people. I'm taking life coaching to like a little bit like the Jewish kind of like direction, and I will be happy to help people through one or two sessions individually. I have specific exercises that will help you find your unique purpose if you find like you can't find it yourself. So if if you want, I'm going to be doing stage. I'll have to do uh, 100 hours and uh, to get my degree. Um, so if you want to be my victim, um, contact me I'll, and let me know. And Bezrat Hashem, um, I'll take, you know, I'll work every few weeks. But I won't be able to work with everybody at the same time, but I would be happy to work with my inner circles, people, you know, that I know. And Bezrat Hashem, you will help me by me practicing and and I, hopefully I could help you, you know, highlight it for you. Uh, so God willing, I give us the blessing to have the clarity to find our mission and to understand and to be inspired by the fact that you have a mission. You're all very special, specific spies put on here and on earth for a specific, unique exercise that no one else could do. Okay. God loves us. We're precious to him. That's why this whole book called Numbers, because he's numbering us all day long, not as a demographic study, as like a global number. It's like you are number 13, unique, unique 13. There will never be another 13. You are that 13. We are each Adam Arishon, the first man. You're each Eve, Chava, the first woman. Individual, unique, and precious to God. So blessing us for a beautiful week. And if you have any questions, insights, comments, rebuke, this is the time. Don't all say it at once. No. <laughs> Why do you suppose that I'm being like, like, what didn't me? tell us? Not tell us. Say it again. This. Why do you suppose? What? Okay, it's an awesome question. To what are I'll tell you. A hint. Okay, so I will tell you this. I think that our soul really does know it. We're not born with like a tag that says made in China, mission is to do this, this, this. We don't come with that. And I think it's because God wants us to find our way. It's like, it's like I cannot teach you how to walk Without you, right, a baby has to fall, get up, learn how to walk. It's developing spiritual muscles. That's how we achieve and reach our unique mission, okay? It's not as simple as Ellie Cohen got his, uh, his instructions, right? But I will tell you that the Torah will help us. If we walk in the Torah pathways, it does give us like the recipe, like we said, for the good life, a good energy, then this this walking in that path is going to bring us clarity, right? And we and I think what we're doing now every Monday is helping us to reconnect with our mission. When we take time for women to get together and learn Torah, 
it's a way for us to realign ourselves, do a restart, right? Do a reroute. And it brings us back to our mission. Because I think each and every one of us really know what our mission is. If you think about it, what is it you're good at? What is it that you love to do? What is it that excites you? What is your calling? And by the way, on the WhatsApp group, our Monday WhatsApp group, I'm going to post a quiz, a quiz that helps you find your calling, okay? I'll also email it. If you're not on the group, um, let me know and I'll add you to the group. Bela, are you on the Monday Torah class group? No, no. But no. usually I'm busy will... this time. I did it for Panina especially. Um, this is really... Okay, so I'll send you, I'll send you this private... I'll send you privately this uh, quiz because it's very, it's very, I did it today in my in-person class and the women loved it. They really felt like it helped them find that mission. Okay. Okay. So Godwin, um, next said Monday we have Shior, will be a pre-shavuot pre class. Yeah. I wanted Thank to make one clarification about King David because I think that Bathsheba's husband had done something disrespectful to the king. So there was a reason they say that he was um, he was desert because there was a you know that one of the mitzvahs says that someone who you cannot be disrespectful to the king and if you are right. you're deserving of death. So I guess there was some distant some reason why David could send him out to war. And then the other thing about King David is he did such an amazing teshuva afterwards. That Sha'al was felt right. crummy inside, but King David took it to a huge level and he did not stop fasting and, and telling Hashem, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and wrote the book of Balaam. So I think those are two more. Bela, things. thank you for highlighting that because what King David did, and, and, and uh, he taught us that even if you sin, and he says this in Psalm, Sheva ipol tzadik vikam, a righteous person will fall seven times, but get up, will fall, but he gets up. He didn't say, you know what, God, I messed up so badly. I'm just moving to Vegas and I'm just going to be, do what I want. He said, you are right. Even though, by the way, in prophecy, Bathsheba was destined to be his wife. Okay. He was just not supposed to force destiny. It was supposed to happen in the right time. And again, we said that we're coming into when we're talking about, the Talmud talks about Shaul and David sinning, sinning. It's, we have to be sensitive that we don't really, we're not on that even level. We don't understand. Their motives were not us commoners. Like, they're in a completely different plane, these people, right? They're talking to prophets. They're, they're, they themselves are prophets. They're, they're kings of Israel. Like, these people are very morally high up there, okay? But what, what King David taught us, that if you fall, you could always get up, you do teshuva, and Hashem will accept your teshuva. Um, so everybody take care and we'll see each other next.